Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good it's 7 a.m., September 16th, 2020, and I'll call this meeting of the Fergus Falls City Council Committee of the Whole to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 We have a quorum. Uh, first item on the agenda this morning is a township maintenance agreement discussion, and we'll call on our public works director, Guy Taylor. Good morning, Guy. section of Main Street that uh, heads east out of the city limits, yeah, this one, um, has been maintained for many years by the city. Um, it's, you can see the pink shaded area, that's city limits. So where the light green line on the top is shaded green, that's city limits too, continues all the way through. Then there's township, and then there's more city limits. All the pink shade is city limits. So there's three entities besides the city of Fergus Falls that have ownership of that road. It made sense that we were there with our equipment doing our city streets. We just continued all the way to Birchwood Estates. And this is for snow plow and uh, grading. Um, and then we turn around. That part makes sense. The part that didn't make sense is that we weren't being compensated for that at all. So now this agreement just puts in place a way to um, be compensated for our equipment and our time that we spend on the township portions of that roadway. Um, so it's just a simple agreement with uh, Dane Prairie Abuse and Ordahl Townships to uh, do that work. And uh, it spells out some of the different types of work, uh, gravel reclamation on the shoulders and mowing, stuff like that. And we would be uh, paid back for actual time and equipment uh, for that work on their portions of roadway. So that's what's before you uh, with the three other townships. The one other agreement, you pull up that other aerial, is with just Fordall in particular. Uh, it's for a broken down dam road. You can see the red stretch of the road um, <coughs> coming off the main, right there. That's Fordall Township Road, and then it splits right there, turns into a city road. So. There again, it makes sense that we do this stretch because we got to get back in here and do this. So we'll just have the same type of agreement with Ordahl Township and take care of that portion of their road and be compensated um, the same terms for equipment and time. Thanks, Guy. Any questions from the council for Guy? So I'd like to make a motion that we bring this to the council on Monday. Thank you, Jim. I'll second. Second, Brent, thank you. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, second item on the agenda is a Godel Park Pier Agreement. And again, Guy Taylor. Thank you. So we were approached by the Minnesota DNR to uh, potentially have them place a fishing pier. It's uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 foot pier in Godel Park on Hoot Lake Shoreline, um, right off of the uh, parking lot near the existing boat launch. So um, with them doing that, they have some requirements and it would be to put a small parking lot here enough to accommodate two or three uh, cars for ADA parking and then the pathway going from the parking lot down to the pier would be something we would have to put in too that would have to be ADA accessible. So um, it's a agreement that we would have to enter into with the DNR to have this placed, similar to the agreement we've got with them for Pebble Lakes Pier. And uh, we would be responsible, like I said, for the parking lot and the walkway, and then for insurance um, for the duration of the placement. And that's basically covered under our property out in the open clause that we've got with our insurance anyway. Now, it will have to be just called out in the policy, but it's really covered under that uh, umbrella. So we're currently maintaining the parking lot, obviously. And the path, is that just like a mowed path that goes to the pier? No, it can be, it has to be something of a surface that uh, can accommodate a wheelchair. Okay. So it's, it can be either crushed asphalt, crushed concrete, or it can be concrete. Do we have a plan for installation of that path? Of path? Uh, 
engineering is looking at that. Um, we're pretty sure we can make grade just going straight from the parking lot down to the pier. Okay. But to make the grade, we might have to do one switch back in there. And, sure. But the pl plan would be for next spring? Potentially this fall. Fall, possibly? Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thanks, Guy. Any questions on that for Guy Scott? The, the path part is what you're talking about. As far as the fall, when would the, the pier actually arrive? They're actually saying it's being constructed right now. Um, prisoners construct these piers for the DNR, and so it's underway, the work is, and it could be up here as soon as October 1st. Great. Someone like to make a motion to bring this agreement to the council? Off there, Your Honor. Justin, thanks. I'll second. Thanks, Krista. Any further discussion? All in favor of that motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Guy. Uh, item number three is the 2021 fee schedule. And with Bill Sonmore, call on our finance director. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you, Council. There's a fee schedule before you. Um, we come annually with changes. Our various departments go through this schedule and come up with different things that we need to address and bring before you. Um, any of these changes that we would make would be effective starting January 1st of 2021. Um, and I know there'll be some questions as we go through along the way. I think there's probably some from the public that would like to possibly speak to this as well. Um, would you like me to go through the entire schedule first, and then we go back and address questions? I think that's a good way to okay. approach it, Bill. Then we'll walk through it, kind of give you a flavor for what's in here. Um, so starting on page one, and I'm only going to address um, proposed changes. I won't go through the ones that are not changing, but under license fees, we have um, mechanical license, so for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, moving that to a straight $200 fee, Right now we have a Class A license for 125, that is for the business. And then the Class B would be for each installer within that business of $40. So making just one business license. Um, so actually this could wind up saving those businesses money when you have multiple installers. So that was proposed by our building department. Uh, let's see. Rolling forward to my page three, um, it's the leachate and septage, moving from $38 per thousand gallons to 45. And this is just bringing us more in line with the market. Um, we know that, say up in Fargo, that's up to $75 per thousand gallons. So we're by far one of the cheapest. So um, stepping that up a bit, but certainly not going you know, all the way up to competitive rates. So we would still be uh, kept in the in the lower range of that. Uh, going under planning and zoning fees, page four, the job Z uh, fee of $300, we will eliminate that fee. That program no longer exists. Um, <coughs> that ran um, from 2004 to 2015. And then we had one business that actually ran through 2018. So our last fee we collected was in January or February of 2019. So if you can just strike that fee from the, from the schedule. Um, jumping to page six, um, building department plumbing permits, residential and commercial. The water heater fee, dropping that fee from 65 down to 35. And our building department's rationale is to gain more compliance with that. Um, very important thing to have inspected would be those water heaters. So um, just in the public safety aspect of that to, um, to make sure people are getting that done. Eliminating the dishwasher fee because that would be covered as an additional fixture where we see down below. So under plum plumbing permits, moving from 3150 to 35, making that consistent with that water heater one we just talked about at 35, and each additional fixture moving to $5, mainly to kind of round those figures up. I don't know, I can't tell you why they were not a round figure before, but um, kind of rounding those up. Flipping to the next, um, the water abandonment uh, services. So that's, if let's say a building gets removed and um, you leave the water service there, we used to have, um, you know, the owner of that 
give us $2,000 and then we will take care of that in the future. Well, a few years back, the policy was changed where the city is taking, you know, taking the responsibility for those um, up to the property line. Thus, there's really no reason for that fee. We're all, we are now taking care of that. So uh, eliminating that fee from the schedule. Uh, then we go up to the rental housing. Uh, so th this is the rental registration program, page eight. Um, you'll see we have two sections here. We have the rental registration. This is the best practices uh, where we're not making any changes to that. Then it's the standard rental registration prior to November 18th of 2018. So these are those grandfathered in properties. Um, now the proposal by staff was to move this from 120 to 140 for a single family home, duplex, 140 to 160. And then for those various apartments, moving from $20 a unit up to the $40 a unit, uh, plus their um, flat fees that would remain unchanged there. Now the goal of that is, is to get um, these properties migrated to the best practices program. So certainly that's a good goal, get everyone on the same program being inspected. Um, as we pulled this off the agenda last council meeting, talked a little bit more at staff, you know, maybe you don't have to do this fee change this year. We know landlords have had a lot of pressure on them with the executive orders where even, you know, struggling with people paying, we struggle with that from um, utilities as well. Um, so it's maybe, you know, it's maybe not a great year being 2020. Um, we could come back next year with this. Um, we left it on here so you could, you can make that decision. Again, remember the goal is to get these grandfather properties to migrate to best practices program. But if you determine this is not the year, that's just fine. We can come back next year probably with something, you know, exactly this or something very similar. So that's food for thought. <clears throat> um, okay. Bill, if we, if we had, did we actually talk to any landlords before doing this? I mean, have we sent anything out? Okay. No, nothing has been. Just the communication early on when uh, the program was re revamped. Right. That we would be migrating everybody into the full yeah. program. I mean, I, I think I agree with Bill that, uh, you know, under under the circumstances of this year, pushing it off a year would be a, a more appropriate thing to do. It's kind of what we were thinking, but yeah. brought that for discussion anyway, so you know what we're thinking long term on this program. Well, uh, let's see. Turning over then, fire department. Um, so hazardous, hazardous materials, um, where it's charged on a per hour, um, but then supplies will be charged at replacement cost. So uh, whatever happens here, whatever supplies we use would just be charged out at our cost. So it's correct, Brian? It, yeah, it was just a typo from previous years. This, okay. It was missing some wordage on the charge. Sounds good. Okay, going forward to the library area, uh, page 11. Uh, one change that is not in here in red that I'm just talking about this morning, and we have Gail Hedstrom on Zoom, so we may want her to weigh in on this as well. The first item, um, books and other materials the, um, for overdue fees. Through the budget process, um, Gail has proposed that we eliminate charging late fees at the library. Now if items were lost or simply not returned, then we do have fees. But Gail, do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you. Um, so for the past few years, the Fergus Falls Library Board has been looking at the possibility of removing late fees. We really addressed this aggressively over the past few months at board meetings, reading research, studying, um, trying to determine what would be a best practice. And what we know to be true is that charging late fees prohibits some people from accessing library materials. I would guess that at any given time, 20% of our cardholders are blocked from library use, which includes digital content and computers because they owe nominal late fees. 
We know that some families choose not to check things out from the library for fear of late fees. And we want to make sure that we are operating as equitably as possible and providing access to materials uh, readily to, to all people. During COVID, we have eliminated fines, as have most libraries across uh, the world, quite frankly. So for the past few months, there have not been late fees. You know, of course, libraries shut down. People couldn't return their materials. We currently quarantine items for 72 hours or longer, you know, making check-ins late, even if items are returned on time. I am confident that we can operate minus um, late fees and, and remain within our budget. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm very confident of that. Our staff is very frugal and we are dedicated um, to making this a reality. Just in the past few years, libraries and Viking library system that have eliminated fines include New York Mills, Morris, and Elbow Lake, and I'm sure more will follow, but we do recognize this as a best practice. <clears throat> Thanks for your work on that, Gail. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Gail. Bill, um, I, well, so how many dollars come in each year from late fees? Uh, Gail, correct me now if I'm wrong, but I yes. think we've had $11,000 in the budget for late fees. Within the 2021 budget, looking at bringing that down to about $2,500. So that remaining $2,500 would still co um, cover the lost, um, not returned items. Does that sound right, Gail? Yes, that does sound correct. Okay. Roughly 1% of our, of our budget income um, comes from late fees. Okay, other changes within the library, uh, videos, DVDs, um, moving that to 25 cents per day, um, the same as what books are now. So Gail, that would still, you're still staying with that change, is that correct? Um, if we charge late fees, those would be the fees that would be in place. Okay. So but if we don't charge late fees, yeah. Okay. Then that would, then be, would be zero. Would be eliminated as well. Um, replacements, um, getting rid of that replacement fee for um, the Minnesota resident card replacement. Moving faxes um, and copies up from 15 cents to 20 cents, still a very good deal um, to get a, a copy there. Um, and then color, um, 50 cents there, fax would be 50 cents. So um, anything else you want to add there, Gail? Have we covered that? No, but I certainly welcome any questions. And if somebody you know wants to stop into the library to talk to me as well, that, that would be just great. Okay. Turning over to campground fees, uh, looking at moving that up. It's it's been years probably since we've made any adjustments. They're going from ten dollars a night to fifteen dollars a night, and then campers twenty moving to thirty. Um, with the thought of uh, maybe we could start, um, you know, a capital fund within that campground area with with some of those revenues. Um, we haven't built in that increase in the budget yet. So if it is approved, when we come back in December, we could probably. Um, put some capital for some future improvements at the campground. That's the goal behind that one. Um, the only thing I question I'd have on that is how do we rate compared to the other campgrounds in the area as far as what we charge? I know we're certainly cheaper right now uh, yeah. with other campgrounds, but of course, if you look at like state parks and whatnot, um, they have restroom facilities and, you know, uh, electricity on, you know, several of lots so we don't have those facilities so it does make sense we are somewhat cheaper um, this would bring us closer um, well i'd still like to keep below the other ones to keep right. us a more you know attractive option i think when um like going to a state park sandy is it 33 35 dollars a night for a camper so we'd still be about five dollars under that okay. all right um, and then looking on to our fields, um, looking at adding some fees here for baseball fields, uh, $35 per practice, $55 per game, and this includes the ISD 544, the youth baseball, and, and other entities as well. Um, and then down below you'll see that softball fields as well, um, that $35 for practice and $55 for games. This would be for field prep is what's being um, proposed. And um, I know we'll have some questions on that, and maybe some people will want to speak. And I know Guy can um, 
share some more information on that as well. So I'm sure we'll come back to that one, um, but that's what's proposed uh, within here. That has been discussed with the school district um, before coming to this meeting as well. Uh, let's see. And then under um, park and recreation contracted classes, eliminating the list of those fees, those are set by the instructor and then the city receives 10% of that revenue for administering the, um, the sign up, the registration and that. So um, the fees would still be there, they're just set by the contractor and then you know we administer the program. So that's up for your discussion. Uh, picnic, picnic shelter and tables, the shelter key replacement, eliminating that fee because we do receive a deposit. That's really what the deposit is for, um, that $25 deposit to cover if they do lose the key. And then sponsorships for youth sports, um, sponsorships moving from 225 to 275 Rationale there that um, our program costs have risen um, since prior to 2010. So this fee hasn't changed in years, and of course costs go up. Same for those banner sponsorships. The banners simply cost more. Um, so going from 250 up to 300 for the first year, each additional renewal then 250. Um, police department area. Just a little note there, adding per calendar year. Uh, Eliminating the background checks for daycares because Ottertail County does that. So we can actually just strike that from our schedule. Security services going from $65 to $75 per hour, two hour minimum there. Uh, we just want to cover our actual costs of our officers when they're doing those security services. All right, that I think summarizes that schedule. Sandy, did I miss anything? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> so I think the uh, there's some people here in the audience. I know uh, Chad Felstool and Bill Grunewald both, I, I assume, are here to talk about baseball. So maybe we just start that discussion um, right off, and then we can call on Guy as well. But Chad, did you want to sure. have some comments about the in increased field fees or the proposed field fees? Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Chad Felstool. I'm here on behalf of the Youth Baseball Association. Uh, we're obviously opposed to the fees for the use of the fields of the $35 per practice, $55 per game. Um, over the years, historically, the Baseball Association has invested heavily into the field that the city owns, whether it was Farmer's Field or Legion Field. I think uh, a number of years ago, when I first came to town, Farmer's Field was just a softball field that was being used primarily to do baseball, did the fundraising, got the grant from the Twins, and went around to local businesses and raised the money to make, actually make that into a baseball facility. And that was substantial dollars that the, the Youth Baseball Association raised. In addition, um, the Legion Field, and this is before I came to town, so I don't know all the history on what happened with the Legion Field, but obviously the Youth Baseball Association now runs the Legion and Junior Legion programs, which primarily use um, the Legion Field out at De Lagoon. And the Legion was instrumental in fundraising uh, for that field, for the scoreboard and everything else like that. So our goal is to be a partner with the city. Uh, we certainly acknowledge that we do use these fields. We are users of not only the two, le the two baseball fields out there, but the various fields around the town for our youth programs that aren't on the big fields. And so what, what we have been talking about are capital improvements to the Legion Field, Junior Legion Field, in the form of a brand new scoreboard out at the Legion Field, new speakers, um, new scoreboard probably out at Farmer's Field and speakers out there as well in addition to, we also have done some work to the press box out there. And so, and also have been talking about batting cages out at um, Legion Field as well. So those probably are in the range of fifty to $100,000 that we're looking at doing, acknowledging that this is on city field. And so obviously we have an invested interest in these fields in making sure that they're good, they're playable, and they're up to speed. Um, and so with these fees, we don't have a whole lot of incentive to do this. Basically what the city is telling us is that you're just a user, not a partner in these organizations. And so we want to improve these fields, but we don't feel that the the user fee is appropriate. We understand and acknowledge that there is time and expense that goes into field prep um, for games and for practices. But the thing is too, is that even if the fields aren't used, they still need to be maintained. Because if they're not maintained, no one's ever gonna be able to use them. Especially with Agerline fields, if you don't drag them, if you don't rake them, 
they're going to get hard, they're not going to be playable. So they're going to be need to be maintained regardless of who uses them. Additionally, looking back at, this is just, I've, I've coached the last three years for our Youth Baseball Association. This year obviously was a little bit of an anomaly because of what happened with the pandemic, but looking back in 2019, with my practice schedule and with my game schedule, we had 10 home games um, from in town here from various um, local teams. We played West Fargo, we played Barnesville, we played um, Breckenridge, we played Ottertail Central, um, uh, Wapiton, and some other towns. And so that, that does bring in an economic benefit to the town because we're playing over uh, the supper time, people are coming in, parents come, a lot of grandparents come too because these are all towns that are within an hour of us. So there is an economic benefit to us having these games here. And in addition, with the practices that we have, with the fee schedule that's been proposed, we charge, um, I think now we're at $170 per kid to play. And looking back at just my schedule from 2019, we would have to at least double that in order to cover the costs for the practices and fields. So we'd be up to $320 to $350 per kid to play. Um, and that just would cover our costs. That doesn't take into account any improvements that we want to help the city with, with fields or anything like that. That's just for paying for <coughs> baseballs, for umpires, for equipment, and that type of thing. So it, it would become cost prohibitive to have a lot of these kids playing. I would imagine that we would lose 50% or more of our players if these fee schedules were imposed because we're going to have to pass this on to our players. So we want to be a partner with the city. We want to work with the city in improving these fields. And this isn't the way to do it because we're going to be disincentivized to do that. Thanks, Chad. Um, any questions for, for Chad? Or Jim? Yeah, just have a little history on, on the field. The, yeah. uh, the American Legion built that. Yep back uh, in the 90s, Late sometime 90s. when I was commander. Late 90s, 98, 97, yeah. 98. And uh, uh, that was all, actually, that was uh, full tap and bingo money that built that back in the day before we had the casinos, the lottery and everything. But, uh, uh, but that was built by the Legion and given to the city. Yep. And, and that's and, where we see our contribution because we've now taken, I think back then the Youth Baseball Association obviously wasn't in existence, but now we have taken over that program, uh, both the Legion and the Junior Legion program. And so we view that as part of our contribution in addition to the farmers and the stuff that we're playing in the future. And I, and I greet Chad with you as far as the partnerships, and I think it's important that we have partnerships with, with organizations like the Youth Baseball. And if I remember correctly, seven, Farmers Field was what, seven, eight years ago? Does that sound right? Yeah, probably. Something, something like that. And at that time, I believe we had a similar discussion about fees. And I think the, the discussion at that time was if we're going to have partnerships with community organizations that are going to, going to invest in city facilities, then charging a fee probably isn't the way to, to, to form those partnerships, it's, um, especially when there's significant investments being made. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars at Farmers Field that was raised within the community um, to invest in that field. So I, I, com I completely agree with. Uh, what you're saying, Chad. One thing I would say is, uh, and we can maybe hear from, from Guy, I think is the school different district a different um, relationship? I think that's a discussion we could have. But I think with the Youth Baseball Association, especially um, the partnerships that have been formed and the investment that you guys have made in our, in our uh, capital. That's yeah, uh, and I just want to make clear, too, that this for the youth baseball, we don't just use those two fields. I mean, we use the David sure. Boone fields, too. We use the fields in town when we're able as well. So that would apply across the board. You know, with with the high school, obviously, it's a different organization than we are, but we do, I mean, Kevin Pearson's on our board, Shane Tilke's on our board, who are high school coaches. And so we work closely with the high school because obviously a lot of the high school kids who play end up playing in our organization in the summer too. So we, sure. we want to work with everybody to make sure. And, and we also utilize the, the levy field to a certain extent that we <clears throat> practice as well, and that's obviously on school problem. Certainly, certainly. Any, um so I would, yeah, I would propose something. that you know, we can have a discussion about the schools, but I would, I would propose that we um, look at removing those fees for the Youth Baseball Association. That's the way I feel. I would do the same. I'm not here on behalf of softball, <laughs> but, 
but obviously I would I would do the same for softball because obviously they're doing a significant contribution to what was field five out at De Lagoon as well and doing the local fundraising for that and the twins grant and that type of thing. So I think it, it should apply to both the baseball and softball as well. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Uh, you know, we'll call him Bill Sonmore. I think you have something to say. And then, Bill, if you had anything to add. No, I can just second his uh, numbers. Of, I've worked on a lot of the capital projects that we're scheduled to do this year. We held off with the pandemic because we didn't want to tax any more local businesses with our fundraising. And we were looking at $84,000 worth of projects this year in the ones that he mentioned. So I, I, I did a lot of the bidding on that. Sure. The projects. Thanks, Bill. Bill, you had something to add? And then I guess the question I would have would be, is there a reason for us to look at the relationship with the school differently than the youth um, programs? That, that's my question. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, they make a really good argument um, for why not charging those fees. And as I was sitting back there, I'm like, okay, I just got done saying we're going to eliminate free fees from the library. So I would, I think you are fine bringing that argument, and I think it makes a good point. And I was thinking, you know, the school probably is a different relationship. <clears throat> Than certainly with our youth programs so i think you could certainly you know not implement those fees for the either of those youth programs certainly agree that if if we don't do it for one we're not going to charge it on the other one as sure. well so um, i think that would be fine you probably still have it with the schools um do you agree with your discussions with the school yeah they haven't appeared to be opposed to it they built it into the budget actually sure so, okay Seems to make some sense, and you could strike strike those for the youth programs out of there. Is everyone in Thanks agreement with yeah. striking the youth yeah. fees? Yeah. Oh, God, Absolutely. Are there other users besides the school and the youth baseball association? Youth Softball. Youth. Uh, well, other, yeah, I mean, there's a city program. Yeah, the whether it's a city, city program or some group that wants to, uh, to do a deal or. Vipers. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of users. So where do they fall then? Are they under which category are they? <laughs> There's uh, the Vipers and the Hurricanes. They pay. Uh, no, we're Vipers. No. We change. That's our organization. Okay. That's the youth base plan. Okay. So in looking at budgets and seeing how we can cover some costs, this is where this came from. And just likening the users on the baseball fields to the users of the hockey arena. Sure. Those users, they did a significant investment in the community too and then they are still charged to user fee. So that's where it was coming from, but uh, sure. that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Guy. So generally speaking, so we have the, we're gonna eliminate the fees to the youth baseball and youth um, softball. We're, is everyone in agreement that we'll, we'll uh, delay the implementation of the rental increase for the uh, yes. yeah. registration yeah. increases? Yeah. Yeah. And then the library, everyone's good with the library. Those are the three main points that I see. Um, so with that, I guess I would entertain a... The only, only thing on the library I would say is, obviously if it's a 1% of your budget, I mean, obviously we're not looking to increase their budget by 1% to cover a shortfall. Yeah. So, you know, they have to make up the, the money somewhere. Which I think Gail said. Ed, Gail, Gail, yeah, okay, we can talk to Gail, but I think she was, that's what I took from her is that she's yeah. going to make sure that she covers those costs. And that has been built in the budget, so they have reduced their budget accordingly as well. So right. That's okay. covered. Thanks. So I would entertain a motion with those changes to the proposed fee schedule. Okay, Your Honor. Tom? I'll second, I'll second it. it. Thank you, Justin. Any further discussion on any of the items in the fee schedule? If not, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, same sign. That motion carries. Good job, Chad. Yeah. Thank everybody. And Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Thanks Chad. Bill. <laughs> uh, item number four is Public Improvement 5266, Deer Valley Street Improvement Petition. We'll call on our city engineer, Brian Yavaro. Good morning, Brian. Hey, good morning, Your Honor and members. Uh, yes, the memo in front of you is in regards to Public Improvement 5266. This is the Deer Valley Street Edition. Uh, in 2019, just to give you a little background, the City Council accepts a petition to install a bituminous street uh, improvement with curb and gutter in this Deer Valley edition that's currently in Gravel Street. Uh, at this time, I just want to refer you to the map that was enclosed in your packet just to show you the roads, uh, the benefiting properties associated with this project, which is uh, County, County 111 is just to the left. Uh, west side of the site, so the petition area includes Deer Valley Road, Ridgewood Drive, uh, Deerfoot Lane, all south of Fawn Lane. <clears throat> so, because this was a petition project, I 
request an appraisal report from Patch and Messner and Dodd. They're the company that does um, appraisal reports for our previous 429 mm -hmm. special assessment projects. So to begin with, we ran an initial design that consisted of a 36 foot wide street, urban section with curb and gutter. Uh, we compared the estimated construction cost of this versus the appraisal report and it indicated a much higher, uh, much higher cost. Uh, we then went back to the drawing board and utilized the 28 foot wide rural bituminous section uh, because there's no curb and gutter, we would have rural ditch drainage. Uh, the valuation, cost comparison between the preliminary assessments with this new design and the property appraisal reports, which is considered the threshold limit of increased benefit from the project. Uh, we indicate this does not support the project from a feasible cost standpoint with this alternative design. The average cost was shown 70% higher and the limit range was varied from negative 25% to 160%. Uh, because we can't assess any more than improvement cost beyond the individual property appraisal benefit, uh, the attached letter with this map was sent to the uh, benefiting properties. Uh, turning to that letter, uh, we indicated if the city staff does not hear from you, we will consider that you do not support the project and or you're simply not interested in having the project move forward at this time. Uh, to date, I haven't received any responses, uh, therefore I'm recommending the project not proceed further at this time. Uh, so the recommendation before you is to terminate the petition for public improvement 5266, uh, Petunia Street Improvement in the Deer Valley Edition. Thanks, Brian. Um, I, I have a couple questions too. So we get a uh, motion on the floor and then we'll discuss Tom, it. Tom, oh. Tom and Ant Second. Anthony. Thanks, you guys. Um, my question is, so, does this mean going forward? Are we looking? At, you know, we've had we've talked about this issue with the appraised value and the, the ability to assess properties based on that uh, increased appraised value. Does this mean going forward that we're looking at probably 100% petition? I mean, because if it's 100% petition, then we can uh, assess. Is that accurate? Well, that, that's one of the options. However, 100% petition, which we have had before, and you still have to have the have challenge. Okay. Uh, we would still, if we could, yes, that would help bolster the effort uh, that we do have support. However, we would still do uh, final cost hearing prior to awarding the project just to ensure sure. Sure. That, you know, it does not occur, but we have been challenged on 100% Yeah, okay. Because this is a difficult... It's a know, very difficult one. It's, it's taken a little bit of time because even the, 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 uh, the consultant that prepared the appraisal say, report took them a long, long petition time. Wanted it? Uh, they could not find a lot of composites uh, for market value. Like that benefit. Absolutely. Uh, These construction costs better. are going up and the, the, the benefit to demonstrate a benefit is, is, is increasingly difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to, I mean, does it, does it also uh, challenge us to find different ways of looking at you know, constructing some of these projects? Um, yes, it does. Uh, like I mentioned in here, you know, we went from a 36 foot wide, which was our standard throughout, to even 26, 28 foot wide, rural section, no curb and gutter. Sure. Even those costs, you know, yeah. about 20% less, still not within that range. Uh, we may have to look at if the council, you know, we don't, we're fortunate we don't have a lot of gravel streets. Right. Uh, but I've been working on some other programs, what we can do in the interim. More dust is the biggest culprit that we hear uh, for grading and everything. So, being that we don't have a solution on this right now, what can we do in the interim? And that's kind of what we're exploring. Uh, with these with these special assessments, the other option, we still have to assess a minimum of 20%. Um, but if the city is willing to increase their contribution rate to these projects as well. Sure. Which is pretty significant when you look at estimated project, this cost about $700,000. Tom, did, Tom, and then Justin. Yeah. Tom. Yeah, I just I'll just say that that's of course my ward, and um, and I've heard from several residents in opposition to the project, and I don't think I've heard from anyone that is in favor of it. So there's not a lot of support. <coughs> sure. Think so, Justin. I just you know you mentioned uh, um, the contour of the road uh, grading, but then also the dust. You know, out of town, a lot of times you'll run on a gravel road and it has, I don't know what it's sprayed with, but it's some sort of a... Calcium chloride is... There you go. Is, I mean, can you do that in... You know, that's even with the PCA nowadays, you know, chlorides are getting to be Learned, you more can't on people's radars. Either. However, I look at it too, you know, the versus road and the volumes and everything, I, I think it's something we could explore because it's not really used throughout the city. 
I don't so, think it's a highly expensive. I mean, that would no, be a it, pretty... it, I think uh, recent on many cents a foot. So, if we could help with uh, things like this, uh, as far as exploring the program, perhaps you know, an annual fee cost share. I think that is something we will better receive. Uh, the other culprit we do have is like washouts. Uh, yes, but we do our intensities of our rains. You know, three, four inch rains. At times in the past year, there's not too much we can do to prevent that other than paving. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are a case by case basis, but uh, I think we need to look at maybe something in the interim just for primarily dust control, whatever that could be. Brent, I got two questions for you. Now, this was petitioned by everybody in this area to have this done? Uh, not by everybody. It met the 35% threshold. Yeah, because I mean, and then the second question is, just to do all the preliminaries on this, what was the cost to the city on this? Uh, this project's been developed before and everything. I think we have about 45000 into the project. Yeah, because, I mean, if we get, you know, a whole bunch of people coming in to do a petition, and then all of a sudden they get the prices, they don't like it, now the project don't come forward, whose pocket is the 45000 coming out of? <laughs> That's the concern that I would have. <laughs> but if they come back later, you've got the work all done, so. Yeah. Uh, we, yes, you're correct. We have to update it and everything. But well, and at yeah. some point, we don't want the gravel streets in our in, in town. I mean, that's the, that's the end goal. We have to find a way to get it done that makes sense for the property owners and makes sense for the city. And so. our residents have to be able to request those types of improvements. I mean, we yeah. can't well tell them that they, tough luck, you know. I mean, if we get if we follow the statutes and, and they petition, it is what it is. I hear what you're saying, but we can't tell people that they can't. Yeah. Oh, I understand that. It's just the idea that we go through all, I mean, that, I get people talking about, you know, you know, the money we spend on roads and everything, but it's, it's, it's don't understand that what we're required to do with engineering and everything else, that takes up a big chunk of the money and that's, the people just don't understand that. Are there certain minimum standards, Brian, that you have to follow when um, exploring these kinds of projects that, that basically result in that fixed cost? I mean, is there any way that you can quote unquote ballpark it? <laughs> um. You kind of, sort of, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I want to point out, up until recently, just doing uh, appraisal reports, those those costs too are all charged against the total project cost. We traditionally haven't had to do those before. So when you look sure. at Leaf Patch, and that was about seven thousand dollars to do those appraisal reports. We've done those at the start. Uh, public improvement five nine five four. That was a big Mount Faith reconstruction project. Burlington. Uh, Avenue that's current in construction. We had to do appraisal reports again. Uh, this is another one, however, a unique project. Dang, it's a gravel, gravel street to paving. And I have another project coming up too as well where we're going to be, and that's going to, where we're going to have to be doing 429 as well. Um, those are additional costs too. So to answer your question, it can be, it, it's been going up because we have to do and a lot of extra work. And I'm sure that you do look for every opportunity to make that as, as uh, efficient as possible. But if you do, if you see areas where you think that that could be improved or streamlined and reduce costs, I we'd, think we'd love, love to hear about them. So, uh, but, uh, but thanks for uh, what you do on that. All right, so we have a motion to terminate the petition on the... You said one question. Okay, Scott, go ahead, yeah. As, as you said earlier, you know, construction costs are going up, and so it seems that the assumption is <clears throat> this is always going to be more expensive in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yet this year, for the projects that were done, we were able to do more because the, apparently the costs and materials were so much less. So I just bring up the point that just to assume construction costs are always going to be more, I don't know that that's always going to be the case. This year it proved to not be the case. Or am I wrong? It depends on what sector I say. I know people in the building sector yeah, was, have a, or construction residential lumber right now have a different lumber. take, you know, so it, it, it's a very confluence of a lot of factors. Uh, I would have to venture, you know, with the platoonists we may see, but you're absolutely right. We do have, and that's why I have some of these projects already. Uh, however, with our unit prices, it's just not the platoonists that goes involved, the grading, uh, all the other culvert pipes and everything that we do need. Those are added into the equation for the total project cost. And yes, the major work item could be the Petumas, and we're hopeful. Yeah, but clearly, if even if we were to dip, uh, um, revisit the engineer's estimate, redu reduce that item, let's say 20%, we're still, like I mentioned, 70% higher mm -hmm. on average. Uh, so it's just not enough at this time. So yeah. it's a very challenge. 
All right, we have a motion to terminate the petition. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, there are no additional agenda items. Uh, I, I have one thing. I know that most of you uh, uh, knew. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Most of you knew Brian Olson, who was uh, was our uh, uh, manager of the liquor store. He passed away yesterday or the day before. Oh. They found him on his dock on his, uh, in his new lake home on Ottertail. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, there's a council meeting Monday night, September 21st, 530. And with that, we'll, we'll be adjourned. Six, 62 years old. Just retire,